There we go. Welcome to Chadev, everybody. See how I think I'm mostly in there. Got to check that camera. Welcome to Chadev. I'm Brett. I'll be your host for the day, as most of you know. Um, just back from Elixir Conference, was up in Washington, so learning me some Elixir for fun and profit, uh, and that was nice. Um, back this week and getting back in the swing of things, um, in my absence, <laughs> I let slide uh, speaker recruitment, and so here we are, coming Sliding into the end of September without um, without any speakers booked for October, so that's fun. We're gonna see how that goes. Um, I think I've been doing this for about two and a half years, maybe. I mean, booking the speakers and all that. And so far, we haven't had had to ditch out on any. Um, on any talks, and that's kind of amazing. Uh, people are always pretty shocked when I travel around and tell them about this meetup, that we hold one every single Thursday, 48 weeks a year. Um, and that's because that's because of all you out here. So give yourself a round of applause, Chad Evs. Yeah, no, that was a little bit weak. Come on, a little bit harder. Come on. There you go. There you go. Get some good energy in the room. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> Uh, so thanks for that. Um, shout out to one Adam Jimerson here who's going to be talking with us next week. Swooped in last minute and, uh, and volunteered to give a talk. So that's a very nice thing. So that'll be a great one. Um, but if you'd like to give a talk, come chat with me. Fully wide open in October. Every single week is, is open. Um, if you've never given a talk before, uh, it's, a, it's a great place to give your first. Um, we provide support um, as well. We'll listen to your talk beforehand. We'll give you feedback. Uh, we also have uh, structured feedback available. Uh, Chadev, uh, uh, co-organizer, will sit uh, while you give your talk and take notes and, and give you some structured feedback afterwards so you can help improve as part of our mission here, um, as well as just generally spreading the good knowledge of all the things software-related. Okay, so uh, anybody want to make any community announcements about meetups? No? Okay, I have one. Next week, next Tuesday, uh, we're having Elixir meetup. Um, we're a small but uh, somewhat growing group, and we'd love to have you join us. Um, the format is we're going through a book right now, and we kind of just do some, uh, some group, some, some gang programming, and it's pretty fun. So it doesn't really matter what your level's at. Uh, we'll take you on and uh, kind of bring you up to speed as needed. So love to have you, anyone join us. Uh, it happens 7 o'clock Tuesday night right over here in this small conference room. Uh, and we're on meetup.com as Chattanooga Elixir. Okay, so now without all that out of the way, I'd like to you all to give, well, not, it's Jay Baker. Jay's a longtime child. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> B&L Consulting, <laughs> Linux System Administrator, all your Jay. Thanks, Brad. Oh, sweet. Okay, cool. It's working. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> Jay Baker here. Um, I work for BNL Consulting. We're up on the seventh floor. Uh, the two offices at the TVA side of the building. I don't know my cardinal directions, but uh, yeah, come up see us sometime. Uh, I'm always happy to talk about any of this stuff. This is, I'm a big nerd, so this is what I do in my spare time too for fun. Um, oh man. It's weird, I've got my, hold on. I had the live channel open on this monitor here. It was kind of throwing me off. Um, but yeah, so let's see. Cool, yeah, today I'm gonna talk about uh, immutable deployment and uh, really infrastructure as code using three tools that I think that are really well suited for this task. I use this stuff um, all the time in my professional job. And this pattern that I'm gonna show you today is used by other companies, you know, in the wild, in production right now, um, and also, of course, by BNL, and by myself uh, personally, just for any projects that I might wanna do. It uh, really gives you a lot of benefits, and hopefully you are gonna see why that is. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, what's the problem? 
Uh, usually, um, these talks start like this, and we're going to say why exactly you would want to adopt a system like I'm going to propose. Um, anyone that works opside, how many admins are in the audience? Or anyone that is kind of forced into that by necessity, um, and you're really, you're really a dev, but you have to go fiddle with servers and stuff. Uh, yeah, so uh, then you'll be familiar with these problems intimately. Uh, and you might even be a perpetrator of some of them, as I have been uh, myself. <clears throat> but yeah, the main problem is uh, Snowflake servers, right? We've all heard this term before, probably. It's these handcrafted, artisanal, free-range, organic servers that, uh, you know, we all sort of just put together by hand. Some, someone lo logs in via SSH um, or, you know, even lamer, they have to install a GUI on their Linux server um, and do everything by hand. They do the, you know, yum commands to install stuff. They're editing config files in Nano if they're a scrub or in Vim or Emacs if they're a super user. Um, and hopefully they document everything that they did and the next person that comes along can, you know, read that documentation, understand it, and nothing was left out, and they'll know, okay, here's what I need to do to troubleshoot, here's how I need to recreate this server. Um, but, you know, we all know how that goes. Uh, so another problem is uh, configuration drift. Um, earlier on in the DevOps world, we saw the rise of a lot of popular configuration management tools like Chef and Puppet, um, including Ansible, which is kind of what we'll be integrating with today, SaltStack, that sort of thing. A lot of companies, it was just an elaborate series of bash scripts, or maybe Python, uh, if they were you know, nicer. Um, but yeah, no matter how, how much you like, truly buy into that configuration management you know, mindset, um, it's just, in, in my experience, it's always impossible to avoid configuration drift. At some point, you know, some problem's gonna come up at you know, 1 a.m., in prod and you're getting that phone call and you've got to go in there and fix it and are you going to SSH in and edit some config file and restart the service or are you going to take the time to look up how to do it in uh, Puppet or Ansible and commit it to your repo and then do your change management that way. Um, you know, we all know what we're really going to do. We're going to, we're going to fix it manually. Um, and so that leads to configuration drift and that's not a huge deal if you can always go back and codify that stuff but in my experience, that just never happens. Oh, whoops. <laughs> Thank you, Principal Skinner. <clears throat> yeah, so, and then the last one, kind of more related to you know, the DevOps world, is that both of these problems exacerbate the problem of dev and ops teams being siloed, right? Um, you know, BNL, we're a consulting firm, so we'll have lots of different projects. We don't have just one piece of software we all develop on. Um, we'll all be working on different projects for different clients who will have different needs, um, and our dev teams are gonna need servers to run their code on, to test and develop, um, to sort of replicate the environment of our clients. Um, and as an admin myself, we're just scrambling to keep up with demand for all these different uh, servers that people need, um, all the different slight variations in configuration. You know, this one needs this version of the JDK, this one needs this version of Tomcat. Um, Y'all know how it goes. And if, if you don't have like a good you know, DevOps sort of mindset where those teams are working together and in collaboration, then it becomes uh, just this over the fence thing, right? And it's only exacerbated because not only are they tossing their code over the fence and the admins have no idea what that code is doing, what changed, you know, what exactly it really needs as a dependency, um, the dev teams have no idea what the runtime environment is gonna be like. Is it gonna be? like what they had on their laptop, or is it gonna be like the dev server? Um, is that now configuration drifted away from QA and prod? Um, so it just causes a whole, a whole lot of headaches. Nobody wants to have, and it's pathetic. Um, yeah, sorry, this, this, this whole slideshow was really just an excuse for me to use all of my DevOps memes, so uh, you're welcome. But yeah, and if you're not doing, if you're not at least doing configuration management, then you have to do documentation, but everyone hates documentation. No one does it right. Um, I'm just as guilty as anyone. It's always that last minute, and maybe you've got time. If you're a consultant, 
You know, maybe you've got time budgeted in to your contract at the end to do that documentation, and that's awesome, but sometimes you don't. And maybe that time is not enough to do it justice. Or maybe you're documenting something you did six months ago, and you're like, oh, I guess this is what I did. Um, yeah, so if you're doing immutable deployment, which uh, I guess we should get to a definition of that first before we dive into infrastructure as code. Um, so just so y'all don't get distracted, we'll go back to Skinner. Um, immutable deployment, um, specifically in the server world, is rather than um, starting up a server and going and doing the provisioning manually or with a configuration management tool, it's you're gonna have the server image that you're gonna launch your service from, it's already gonna have everything it possibly needs uh, to run and be useful and to be you know, the runtime environment for your code or to have Docker installed or to be you know, a Kubernetes node or whatever it is, right? Um, and just the most basic way you could do this is you could still do manual immutable deployment. You could fire up a server in AWS, SSHN, you know, configure it by hand and then save that AMI and then later deploy that to your production VPC or whatever. Um, so th that is a way to do immutable deployment. It's not how we're gonna do it, it's not a good way, but that's basically what it is. Um, yeah, infrastructure as code though, this is what, uh, I guess I could have put this in the title talk, but there's just too many words. Um, this is really what's gonna enable us to do immutable deployment correctly um, because you know, like I said, even if you're doing immutable deployment by doing that manual method and saving your AMI, and that's gonna be our general purpose server image, um, you still have all the same problems that we mentioned earlier with Snowflake servers. So, infrastructure as code is about codifying uh, the entire environment. Um, and this really only applies to a cloud type environment, like a programmable infrastructure, right? Um, so if you're just using like Microsoft Hyper-V or uh, you know, whatever other um, sort of hypervisor you might be using, it's not really gonna apply because there's not a way to interact with that programmatically with the API. I think Hyper-V you can use command line tools, but you get the idea. This is more for if you're on AWS or OpenStack or DigitalOcean. Um, I believe Terraform, uh, which is the tool we'll be using, also works with VMware. Um, basically, you need a cloud platform that you can interact with programmatically, either through a CLI or through a REST API, preferably. And what it gives you is if you can codify everything from the virtual networking, the security groups, the network access control lists, um, you can even throw in your IAM profiles. If we're talking AWS, it's gonna be a very AWS heavy talk, so sorry if you don't use it, but that's what I use. Um, but yeah. So it allows, uh, these four things right here I definitely wanna to touch on. It allows you to make um, every part of your entire operation from the provisioning of the server, you know, up to the, the instantiation of servers from that image, up to the virtual networking, up to the runtime environment, the code that you're running, every bit of it gets to be these four things. Codified, versionable, templatable, uh, it's kind of beyond the scope of this, we'll touch on it a little bit, and auditable, which, you know, if you're doing anything security heavy or if you wanna you know, try to achieve uh, HIPAA compliance, you know, it, trust me, uh, it helps to be able to show specifically, exactly, precisely how things are set up, when that change was made, who made that change. Um, it'll, you know, CYA, as they say. But uh, yeah, it's just like, um, you know, I put this part up here about the top as uh, if you were a developer, you know, would you wanna work on a project that doesn't have source control or versioning and, you know, poor documentation at best? Like, of course not, that would be terrible. Who would do that, you know? Well, that's what the ops world is like if you don't do infrastructure as code, basically. Um, and it's, it's no fun. So yeah, here's our basic workflow that we're gonna be showing today. Um, guess you could maybe swap out Packer and Ansible in the workflow, but uh, these three tools right here are what we're gonna be using. Um, and we'll go ahead and let's talk about them. Ansible is a configuration management tool. We mentioned that earlier. Even if you're not doing immutable deployment or infrastructure as code, Ansible is a valid config management tool. A lot of companies use it. It's backed by Red Hat now. It's pretty cool. Um, the reason we're choosing it is because it's uh, serverless. You don't need to have some server running all the time, like say with SaltStack or something like that. 
and it also doesn't need any agents, right? Um, the only agent it needs is SSH. So if we're gonna connect to a remote server and provision it, install the packages and things that we need and set up the firewalls and such, um, if we're doing a mutable deployment, you know, that server doesn't exist yet, right? We're, gonna, we're building an image. We're not connecting to something and then setting it up and leaving it. Uh, we just wanna connect to it, you know, bring something up, connect to it, provision it, and then save it. Uh, and we want that all to be automated. The Ansible just makes it really easy because you don't have to already have the agent on there. Um, the only requirements are SSH and uh, the only requirements are SSH and Python, which almost every Linux distribution has. I think it supports Windows, but I don't really care about that. I don't know why you're using Windows. Um, yeah, so, Ansible. Oh, let me get back over here. Uh, Packer, this is an awesome tool. It is a tool for building uh, machine images, right? Um, it can build, you know, Amazon machine images, AMIs. It can build DigitalOcean images. Uh, whatever OpenStack calls their images. Um, it can build Docker containers, um, all using the same uh, config files and using a variety of provisioners. So the way our setup is gonna work is we're gonna invoke Packer to build us a machine image that we've defined in the config file, and it's going to call Ansible to do that provisioning. So we could swap out the Ansible part and say, no, actually just run this bash script to provision it. So if you don't have any configuration management yet, you just have a series of commands that you cut and paste from a, a guide in a JIRA ticket or something. Um, just put that into a file, put the shebang slash bin slash bash, and you can already get started with Packer and do a mutable deployment. I wouldn't recommend that, like maybe adopt something like Ansible or, you know, if you've already got uh, Salt Sack or Puppet or Chef, you can use those too. But uh, it's very versatile in that regard. And you can also build multiple you can build multiple images from multiple platforms at once. So say you're doing a multi-cloud deployment, you've got some stuff on Google Cloud and some stuff on AWS, put that in the same file. You can build identical-ish images for both platforms uh, with the same command. And finally, Terraform is our infrastructure as code tool. This is what's gonna take us from like our immutable images to something that's actually deployed you know, in real life. We're gonna instantiate these images. Um, Really, really awesome tool. I just, I wish I had known about it sooner. Um, anyone that's had, anybody here work with AWS professionally or just for fun? Yeah, then you guys know what a pain it is to slog through the console and, you know, click these, ah, I hate it, I hate it, actually. Uh, it's so bad. <laughs> um, yeah, with this, you never have to see that stupid console again. You can just have everything perfectly codified and you can live inside your Vim editor or your, you know, Atom or Sublime or whatever you use. Everybody should just use Vim, though, to be honest. But, uh, yeah, it's gonna allow us to write in their domain-specific language, they call it HashiCorp config language, really, really simple to use. Um, also accepts JSON, um, why you'd wanna do that. But uh, you get to define, here's our virtual private cloud, here's our internet gateway, here's our, our NAT, Here's our security groups, here's our network access controls, um, all that stuff. And just have it all perfectly codified in our repo. And not only that, it also supports uh, uh, variables, so we can make templates, right? So we can make our general purpose, it's really useful if you're a consulting firm, because you can make a general purpose set up that'll work for most clients most of the time. And just go in and edit a few variables, add in a few extra servers, change the security groups, and you're good to go. All right, so what, what if, we, if we have these tools, right, if we're gonna get these things on, installed on our laptops, um, what, are, what are we gonna build, all right? Whoops, I don't wanna spoil that. We'll, we'll get back to that, we'll let y'all see those memes. Um, so here we go, here's the demo portion. Um, whew, hopefully the spirit of Kelsey Hightower is with me today. All right, so. Can, can y'all see this text? Do I need to make this larger? Everybody see this in the back? Uh, okay, cool. So basically in our, uh, we've got a little repo right here and I'll share this, the link to this repo at the end of the talk. Y'all can you know, download this and play with it yourselves. Um, that's one of the beautiful things about infrastructure as code and immutable deployment is that 
even if you don't understand any of the stuff that's being provisioned in here or how it's being configured, you only need three commands and you know, sufficient access privileges on AWS to replicate exactly, precisely what I have done, right? So you don't have to understand how to, I mean, all we're doing really is installing Docker, but you don't have to understand that. Um, it could be, you know, a thousand step provisioning. You wouldn't have to know any of that. You could just clone the repo, run the commands, and you're good to go. Um, so uh, the way I like to structure my projects is uh, always throw in a readme um, for whoever comes along and just include some general usage in there. And then I'll have three directories, uh, one for Ansible, which is our server provisioning, one for Packer, which is for building our images, and one for Terraform, which is our infrastructure's code. So let's go into our Ansible directory. Um, I forgot to get ignore the retry files. Oh, oh well. All right, so. Yeah, this is um, a playbook, that's what Ansible calls them. Um, and this is just gonna say, uh, you know, for this, you know, for the server, you know, find this variables file, which is where you would wanna do your templating. In our variables file, all we've got is one variable, which is called project, um, just to demonstrate sort of how that would work. But you could fill it in with a ton of stuff. In production, I'll have things like my uh, um, console sort of uh, encryption key, that sort of thing. Um, all sorts of like lists of users you might want to include on a server to give them access. Um, here though, when, once we get down to where it says roles, um, these are all of the uh, sort of provisioning steps we're going to do, and we'll break those down here in a second. Let's let's take a look. Um, So here's, here's our role to install Docker, which all this is, if you go on the Docker page, this is just taking their instruction and converting it into Ansible. Um, it's like, you know, I wrote this in just a few minutes, pretty easy, but uh, now we're basically saying, you know, install these dependencies that uh, we're gonna need to add the Docker repo using this command, and then come down here and install Docker, and then uh, make sure that it's uh, started and enabled. Um, at boot time. And the others are, all, the other roles are the, pretty much the same. Out of there. Yeah, Pat, like, uh, let's see here. Do what? Oh, yeah, my bad. I didn't even think about that, guys. Yeah, so, actually here, let's, up here at the top. Yeah, so you could just list, like, you know, this could be a ton of other packages that we needed. Um, this would be, like, in, in your Ansible roles, that's where you're going to put all the basic things that you need to do to get your server provisioned and ready to run uh, the code that your dev team has written. Um, you could include your also your security stuff, like your uh, firewall rules, um, your SE Linux, uh, that's, a, that's a whole nother topic. All right, so once we've got all this basic stuff um, sort of written out and codified in Ansible or whatever our provisioning tool is gonna be, um, what I'm not showing is that you would wanna test that by running the Ansible, using the Ansible playbook command and test it against a VM or something like that so you can be sure that it works. So that your testing method isn't just running uh, Packer, basically. Um, but we're gonna skip over that aspect. Come in here to Packer. So, uh, oh, whoops. Yeah, unfortunately, Packer is configured via uh, JSON, so it's kind of a pain to work with, but uh, and it's also a little tricky to do uh, variables and templating with. Um, but uh, we'll define some variables up here at the top, 
Uh, ba basically, the reason you want to do this, um, and also have a variable file, is so that you can reuse your templates and just cut and paste them and change a few things in there. Um, so here we have the builder step. So this is where we're saying, hey, we're going to build an Amazon EBS backed uh, AMI. Yes, sir. It is, I, I don't know, uh, all I know is uh, this is how you do variables right here. Um, it's probably changed some. I haven't kept up a ton with Packer development and all the new features and such. Because um, I, all I do is just build, it's, ju it's just an extension to run Ansible and build my images. So uh, I'm not a super expert on Packer other than to say, you know, this works, this is how you do it. Um, so yeah, you define um, what you're going to build. Um, here we're going to build an Amazon EBS backed image. Um, and so we can say some interesting stuff right here. This is really useful. Anybody ever have to encrypt the boot volume on an EC2 instance and had to do that manually, manually through the AWS console and it's a giant pain in the butt. Here it's just encrypt boot, true. We're done. It's going to do it for us. Um, we don't have to give it any uh, SSH keys, right? So we don't have to, wherever this is running doesn't actually have to have um, any SSH keys on it. It's going to, Packer's going to talk to AWS, generate a temporary key pair, and use that to communicate with our instance while it's being provisioned, and then I'll just delete it when it's done. So it's a nice little security feature there. Um, then we always want to add some tags. See, this, this is a great thing, too, about doing immutable deployment infrastructure as code because you just put the tags right here um, in your codification. Um, so that way, you know, if you've worked with AWS and you're looking through somebody else's setup and they didn't tag anything, like at best you might get, you know, the name tag. So you know the name of the server other than just like the instance ID. But it's, it, it's not very helpful sometimes. It's helpful to have more information. So here we can have the version of our AMI, right? So now we're versioning are immutable server images. Um, so that way, later, you'll see in Terraform, we can deploy a specific version. If that version has problems, we can roll back to an older version, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and then this right here, um, UUID, Packer will just generate a unique ID for you. Um, I haven't really used it, but it might be useful. Uh, and here we get to provisioners. So we could say, here we're saying, we're gonna use Ansible to provision, and uh, we just name our playbook file the same as the name of our server. Um, so that way we can just cut and paste this part for any of our uh, server images we might be doing. So just go up one directory and find, uh, you know, dot dot slash ansible slash name of our server dot yaml. Um, since we're doing CentOS, we do the user here. If you were doing, um, some other distro, obviously you would want to use whatever Amazon's default user is for that distro. Um, and you can also add post processors. All we're doing is just going to print out some stuff in JSON to save for later, but you can do some cool stuff with it. Um, so actually, oops, let's. Let's, let's um, pretend like we just, you know, our developers said, hey, actually, uh, we need to make these changes to the server. I actually need this version of the software, or you know, the permission on this file is uh, too restrictive. My program can't do what it needs to do. So let's pretend like we made those changes in our Ansible config, and now we're going to produce a new version of our server image. All right. Complete new server shutdown. All right. So. Downside is I'm on, I'm on Arch Linux, and I use the Packer <laughs> is the name. Packer is the name of, a, of the package manager uh, AUR helper that I use, so I can't just type Packer. I should have thought of this beforehand. So I have a shortcut in my bash RC uh, for. So we're going to validate our file. Um, the actual command here, I can, t I can still type it out, though. So that's what you would do, we would validate our file. But that's all that is short for, really. I'm gonna read that and make sure we've 
formatted it correctly, that our JSON is correct, we didn't miss any commas or anything like that. Um, and then we just do We're gonna take a little while, it's not really doing a whole lot, it's just installing a few packages, it's just take a few minutes. Um, but while that's going, um, why, don't, uh, why don't we go ahead and come over here, look at Terraform. All right, so there's a little bit more stuff in here, just because for AWS, you have to define your, all your virtual networking, it's not, um, it's not like DigitalOcean where you just, it's just, I guess I could have done this in DigitalOcean, but um, you know, with those things you just say, give me a server, and they handle all this stuff in the back end for you. But I just wanted to show sort of uh, you know, wh what you can do with it. Um, so there's a bunch of files in here. We'll start with, uh, start with our variables file. Um, this is gonna help us make, uh, oh yeah. If you have CalSay installed, uh, Ansible has a little Easter egg for you. Um, it'll let CalSay print the output, so it's always nice. You know, you've gotta have CalSay, how can you not have that? Um, yeah, so up here we have our project. So this you know, allows me to cut and paste uh, from another project we have, which I totally didn't do. I wrote all this fresh just for this demo. Um, and we can version our whole infrastructure if we wanted. Um, have different environments. Uh, we're gonna define what region it goes in, um, all that sort of stuff. Um, here, uh, we can have, this is useful if you have a lot of, we're just doing one server in this demo, but if you had a lot of servers, you could say, well, for this type of server, I, you know, use this size. For this other type of server, use this other size. Um, so it just makes it easy to reference. You don't have to type it in there. Um, and if you have a lot of instances of that server type, um, you can just change it in one place here. So that's, and we all get the reason to use variables, hopefully. Um, but the key part here that's gonna tie this together is this line here, variable packer build version. Um, so over here in our file, we bumped our version to 1.0.1, right? Because we made these you know, uh, imaginary changes to fulfill you know, the never-ending needs of our development team and our AMI version that we want to deploy is now 1.0.1. Over here in Terraform, it's still the old version. So if we want to update that, uh, swap it out. Whoops. And where that comes into play is uh, this file, data AMI. Wait, y'all can't see that. Yeah, so what this is saying is, so any, any of these uh, sort of data resources in Terraform, um, it's gonna go out and talk to AWS and gather some information and bring it back uh, to, to our local instance of Terraform to help it do something. Right here, we're saying, look for an AWS AMI, um, and within, within Terraform, we're gonna call it Docker node. Um, and you wanna filter, you're gonna look for it by searching through tags. Um, so we're gonna look for the tag version, and then we're gonna look for the value that we specified in our variables file, which we just bumped up by, you know, dot one. Um, we're gonna find the most recent version of it, so if I accidentally build two AMIs with the same name or the same version, um, well, I won't let you do it with the same name. But if I do two with the same version, it'll find the most recent one. And then we're just gonna do a quick regex on, we know Docker's in the name, so that's gonna narrow it down for us. Th this, all this right here is gonna get us the AMI that we're building right here. Um, then let's take a look at. Um, yeah, so again, it just allows you to define all of your different uh, virtual networking stuff, and it makes it really easy to do tagging. You can see here in the tags, I've done var.project, so you know, even though I cut and pasted this from another project, 
all I had to do was change the project variable in the variables file, and now it's just, it's just as good, right? I know there's a lot more to Terraform than this, I and mean, we're not even getting into modules or anything like that, um, but you can really cut down on the amount of work you have to do um, as, uh, as a developer, as a operator, um, if you can embrace Terraform. Um, let's look at our instance. Um, yeah, so we're just gonna define our instance. Um, again, we see where that data comes in handy. So that's how we're gonna know what AMI to use because our data file earlier went out and found the precise version uh, of our AMI that we've just built. It's, it's just finishing up now. Um, be ready in just a minute. Uh, I'm, re I'm really glad this build worked because that would have sucked. I had to wait a long time. <laughs> Demo gods are smiling on me for now. Um, but you can define, this is where you'd add extra EBS volumes, uh, any other options. You could set an IAM profile. You're gonna say what subnet we're gonna put it in, what security group, uh, that sort of thing. Um, Security groups is another good thing to codify um, because if you, what, what'll happen a lot of times on a project is you'll make a security group uh, for these servers over here and you'll make another one for these servers over here and it's just such a pain because when you go in the console to look at what security group a particular server has, it just gives you the security group ID, it doesn't tell you the name of it. So then you have to click on that, it's, uh, it's maddening, uh, but here, we just look in our file, we see what's allowed, what's not allowed. Um, we've got some pretty basic rules here. We're just gonna allow SSH and HTTP and HTTPS and ping, and then allow all outbound. But you can get really elaborate rules here. Um, you can couple that with ACLs. And if you ever have to, if you ever troubleshoot networking on AWS or in these cloud uh, environments, then uh, you know what a pain that can be and having to look through all these different things and see how your ACLs and your security groups are fighting against each other. Um, it's, not, it's not a fun time. But uh, if you get it all codified all in one place, it makes it a lot uh, simpler, right? So. Yeah, so just, I guess just real quick, one, one more thing on Terraform before we finish. Uh, right now, it's using local state. So these two files right here, terraform.tfstate and uh, the backup version of that, that's how Terraform knows what is the state of our infrastructure, right? Like if I, if I were to run uh, Terraform apply, uh, it wouldn't work right now because the AMI is not ready. But if I were to run it and this was ready, then it, the first thing it's gonna do is say, well, here's what I know about in my state file. Let me talk to AWS and see how those two match up, right? So. Uh, that way you can run Terraform apply over and over and over again. And if you haven't defined any new changes, it won't do anything. It'll say, no, actually the state is how it should be, right? I see what the user wants, I see what's there, they're the same, I got nothing to do. But here in a minute, uh, once this AMI becomes ready and I run Terraform apply, then it will see, oh, there's a new version. You know, that's different, actually, th none, of this ex none of this infrastructure exists right now. So it's gonna see that nothing is there and it's gonna go and create it for us, basically. Um, right, while we wait on that, now might be a good time to leave these on the screen. You know, some uh, very dank memes here that I've had in my personal stash. Uh, but it was very useful to toss into the Slack channel at work. Um, I guess I can make these available after the talk as well. I should have put together a zip. I'll, I'll do that. I'll put together a zip file and link it on the GitHub. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, so um, I guess I think, uh, let's go ahead and, do you have a question? No, no, no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Bring some DevOps on it. Um, yeah, so I'll do a quick recap on some of the stuff we've been talking about while we're waiting on our uh, command to finish. Um, yeah, so the idea here is that codification is better than documentation. Right? It's not that we don't, we shouldn't document things. I mean, you still have to. You have to know how to run these commands, how, the, how our repository is laid out, um, you know, what's the process for if you want to make a change, you know, how are we going to version things, that sort of thing. 
um, what version of Ansible and Packer and Terraform are you going to have installed, that sort of thing. Uh, so you still need the documentation, and you need the documentation for why things are provisioned the way they are. But for the actual process of doing that provisioning, of setting things up, it is always, always going to be better to have that codified than to just hopefully someone wrote it down in a JIRA ticket or in Confluence or Redmine or whatever you're using. Um, because just inevitably, somebody's going to make it. It's, it's all about taking the human out of the equation for all of this, right? Um, and the other good thing about this codification is that, you know, humans can read documentation. Humans can also read codification, right? Like, all of this is pretty simple stuff. I mean, the JSON's a pain. But you can pretty much tell what it's doing, um, even if you're not familiar with any of these tools. It should be fairly straightforward to follow. Um, how much time do I got, Brent? All right. Well, instead of waiting for that to finish, we're just going to apply our old version because we didn't really change anything anyways. We already have an AMI that is 1.0.0. Just apply that. All right. We'll see Terraform in action real quick. Uh, first thing you want to do is Terraform plan. Uh, this won't actually ch make any changes. This is just going to, oh, you're kidding me. I think we're still, we must still be connected. Okay, okay, here we go. Quick check. Yeah, okay, we're good. All right, so let's run that again. Terraform plan. So this is gonna see First thing you'll see is you'll see the data come up there. That's where it's going to check um, how we define in that data file. Okay, we're looking for that. Let's just go back up and see that. Um, we're looking for that data file to see, okay, he wants this version. Let me see if I can find it. Okay, I found it. Now I'm going to return the AMI ID, because that's what you actually need to bring up an EC2 instance is that ID. And here we have uh, all of this output right here. This is what it's saying. Okay, based on the configuration you have, this is what I'm gonna make. I'm gonna make a, a internet gateway, a VPC, all these other things. Um, and it hasn't actually done that yet. Now, if we had some stuff there already, um, and we actually had bumped the version number, then it would say uh, it was gonna destroy one, right? Because to bring up our new version, it's gonna destroy the one that's there and replace it with our new version, basically. Um, or if we had had like five servers, and now we only need four, and we deleted one of those files, then it would say, oh, one to destroy. All right, so this is what we want. We want to do it. We're going to hit Terraform Apply, and it's going to go out and bring these things into life for us. So it's going to refresh the state again. Um, we could have saved that plan file, and it wouldn't have to do this step, but that's fine. So now it's creating all this stuff. We had to go quickly, and uh, yeah. So that's pretty much it. Um, I guess we can watch it uh, finish out there. But uh, I guess I'll go ahead and while this finishes up, um, I was going to show you like SSHing into the server we just created, but I mean, really, who cares about that? Uh, I do have one piece of swag. I've got this lovely BNL mug, um, which I'm going to give to whoever asks the most flattering question about myself. Uh, so if you can make me look real smart, I think my bosses are watching the live feed, so, you know. Pressure is on. Uh, anybody got any questions? Yeah. How long are you? <laughs> <laughs> not, not as long as you. Um, I, I actually shaved it for the first time in about, I don't know, seven years, a few months ago. And uh, I, I, I do not look good without a beard. Uh, the first thing uh, my girlfriend asked, like, how long is it going to take to grow that back? This looks terrible. So yeah. Any, uh, any non-beard questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, oh yeah, I3 window manager, obviously, only way to go. 
I'm sorry? Oh, yeah. The question was, what window manager am I using? So uh, I guess the full story here, this is uh, Entergos, basically just Arch Linux with an installer. Um, and the window manager is i3, uh, it's tiling window manager, fun, it looks cool. You know, everybody's like, oh, he's a hacker, he's got these, you know, he can open up these windows, it looks cool. Um, so it's really the main reason I used it for this talk. Um, I also use GNOME sometimes. Uh, anyone else? All right, All right, everybody give a round of applause to Jay. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next week.